at that time, if you were responsible and approved, they would allow you to board a pony for the summer and use it as you chose. I did not board one, but I took advantage of some friends that did have one there occasionally. Across the road on the north side was a cherry orchard, Von Duren's Cherry Orchard. <clears throat> we played softball as kids at uh, Grandma Hess's pasture, which was uh, lined with a wall on there, and uh, many other games around the neighborhood. We had no organized recreation or sports, no far, uh, park district, anything of that nature. You run your own, you created your own thing. I think we we're pretty lucky that we had what we had. Uh, as I grew older, we went down uh, to Goat Springs frequently, down the railroad tracks, which is a couple miles southwest of town, playing in the creek and the woods and all this sort of thing. In the first grade, I went to town school, District 52, to Miss Mary Itland, and uh, she taught here for many years and was known throughout the state for her accomplishments in teaching. Then I went back to District 50, Central District, which is 51, which I really lived in. Central School at that time was a one-room school. It's where the Washington Church of Christ is now, across from the nursing home. It was a one-room school. And uh, I had Miss Florence Meddy for my last six years in, in uh, grade school. And our last year in school, there were 28 students, five in the eighth grade, which was the biggest class the <laughs> school. A popular game to play in the schoolyard was Handy Eye Over. I imagine most of you have never even heard of it. <laughs> well, there's a few here. <laughs> you remember what it was when you used to say pigtail? You just hollered Handy Eye Over and went to throw it over. If it didn't go over, you hollered pigtail, and that left the people on the other side know it wasn't coming. So you waited for the ball to come back, and then you started over again. And we played ball games across the road in the Wilhart pasture, boys and girls on the same team. And occasionally we'd play a game against uh, Hopewell or uh, Columbia or Liberty School. This was not an organized thing, it was just a get up thing. Uh, we rode our bikes or walked to school. There was no running water in our school. There was a shallow well out with a pitcher pump. You go out daily and get a pail of water and had a dipper, and that was the water. I went two years to the old high school on Walnut Street, which is now torn down, and then two years to what I call the new high school, which is where the school is now. We had great fun playing there while they were building the school. There were a lot of scaffolds and all sorts of piles and things to do where you could have a good time. Occasionally after school, we'd get a cup of uh, grapefruit juice and a handful of shell pecans. This was government surplus. This was a method, they bought a butter, but we didn't have any use for it there, and they would distribute these things around the different schools throughout the state. There were no lunch programs at either high school or grade school. I played a little football and was class president in the class of 44. There were 48 class members in our class. We had lost a few early to early enlistments in the military. I delivered bread and meat for Ortwine's Meat Market after I got my driver's license at the age of 16. That was during the summer of 1942. And on Saturdays during the ensuing school year. I delivered many 15 and 20 cent orders of steak, believe it or not, <laughs> delivered. <laughs> Saturday was the best delivery day. Baking took place and very often I got samples of cooking. <laughs> <laughs> In the summer of 1943, I worked at the canning factory I was a syrup man. I made the juice that goes in the can of the peas and corn. Uh, I was fortunate enough to stay on all summer, and they used it to convert the equipment over in the summer and pork cans for the next one to come in. In the evenings, uh, kids would go uptown. It was very popular to sit on the square in that time. There were benches all around. Big elm trees, of course, in night you didn't notice that. It was a beautiful place. It still is. But the trees added a lot to it. <coughs> Uh, cannonballs of the Civil War Memorial once in a while rolled down Yard Street during this time. <laughs> Wednesday was band concert night 
And Hollins had their fresh popcorn machine set in front of the barber shop and billiard parlor. And the drug stores, the Steinleys and Linders, had uh, fountain popes of uh, cherry, lemon, and chocolate. And uh, Mr. Steinley had a doll, a large doll. And when he worked behind the counter at the fountain, sometimes the dog would uh, come up there too. And if the dog barked, the ice cream scoop and take a little ice cream out of the container and flip it. That dog very rarely missed catching the dog. <laughs> uh, Mr. Linder ran the Rexall drug store, which was famous for the $50,000 chocolate. Now, those of you who are old enough to remember, that was good chocolate. It made great milkshakes and chocolate sodas, I'm telling you. They're really hard to beat. There was an occasional black and white movie shown on the south wall of the Danforth Bank, which is now Bank Plus. And, uh, <coughs> in the later years, boys would get coffee in the evening, either at the back of Marshall's Tavern or Mickey's. Uh, behind Marshall's bar, there was a separate room and a side door coming in from the alley. And they were pretty famous for their steaks and food. I enlisted in the Navy V-12 program while still in high school, which was the Navy officer training. Um, a month after I graduated, I left for service, which for me was at Wabash College at Crawfordsville, Indiana. I spent five quarters at this school. After VE Day, they closed the program at that school and transferred to the University of Illinois, which was an NROTC program, which was similar. And after VJ Day, uh, that program was shut down, and we were discharged in June of 1964. I went back to the University of Illinois and joined the peacetime NROTC and graduated in February of 1948 with degrees in civil engineering, naval science, and a commission in the Civil Engineering Corps of the Navy. I then worked 20 years for Burn Peoria, which was a company that built Marquette Heights doing survey work. Where Mar Marquette Heights was, when we moved in there, was strictly hills and woods. It wasn't even cultivated. It was just rough ground. We laid out roads, uh, built roads, water system, sewer system, and everything to build a community. The first homes were all what I would call a prefab or pre-built. Up where the commercial district is in town, they made an assembly line. It's probably something like we're finding over at Deer Creek now. We'd start at one end, they build the wall, and the time it got down to the far end, there was a crane that would lift that wall and another three for that home, put it on a semi-flat bed, take it to the home site, another crane would set it on, and the home would be set up shell-wise in just a matter of a few hours. Uh, that, to me, was the first mass-produced or home of that type that I had a chance <coughs> to be with. Uh, unfortunately, they were about a year or so late. The area was never built to its full potential then because Caterpillar had passed its peak of hiring and uh, they could build more homes than what they could sell. So when they built as many homes as they felt were necessary at that time, they moved on to a project off the east coast of the government. They asked me to go along and I refused. And at that time, I joined my father in the well building business, which is Emmyer Company, formed in 1888 by my grandfather, where I worked for 48 years. I married Winnie Workle in uh, October of 1949, and I have two daughters, Betty Laughlin and Ellen Dingledine. And I unfortunately have five great grandchildren. <clears throat> we joined the Washington Presbyterian Church. In 1952, and I served three terms on a church session. I was a director of the Illinois Water World Association for 28 years, serving in all chairs. Governor Ogilvie appointed me to serve on the State of Illinois Licensing Board for the Water World Contractors and Pump Installer Contractors. And I served 24 years on that board, 18 years as a chairman. I'm currently a member of the Central Regional Groundwater Protection Committee and a member of the Tazewell County Health, which I have been for 18 years. I served 35 years as bank director for Danforth Bank and First National Bank of Washington, which later merged with Heartland Bank and Trust. 
I also served 20 years on the United Fund Board. Washington was a community of about 1,700 when I grew up. You knew everybody in town, everybody knew you, you spoke, I mean it was just like one big family. Now we have a community of about 13,000. I feel it was a great place to grow up. I wouldn't have traded for anything. There have been many changes that have taken place. I'm still very proud to say that I grew up in Washington, Illinois. Thank you. Every year, a couple times a year, some old teacher would walk up to me and say, are you sure you're Zellerine King's sister? Because they could not believe that anybody like me was related to someone of such sterling character. <laughs> At that age, I could not wait to get out of Washington. But when the time came, I was glad to come home. The changes, mostly in the size, like you talked about. By the time I was in fifth grade, we had to run to Washington. And we would hike out to Goat Springs, and occasionally we would pack a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and purloin a few cigarettes out of our dad's packet and we would ride our bikes all the way out to Red Tip. Does anybody know where Red Tip is? It's right in the middle of the subdivision. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not all the way out to Red Tip anymore. And yes, the first time I went to Goat Springs, I went skinny at them, did you? <laughs> the square is different. I miss the bandstand. Um, I'm glad they preserved it as well as they have. It may, it makes it special, famous if you will. But the best part, as Bill said, is the people. Now and then, the people knew you then, the people, the people I know now, it's nice to be a small town. I always tell people I'm a corn-fed flatlander and proud of it. And I'm especially proud to be part, on occasion, of this famous little corner of the world. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, I look back and here's Rod laying on the floor. He cannot stand the sight of a needle. And according to his son, he never did get over it. He always tried to just get there. Anyway, okay. Um, some of my good memories were when I was growing up, we played a lot of football back in those days. We played football where the lumberyard is now. It's the Washington High School football field. And my mom used to raise holy heck every time I there was no button left on my shirt. <laughs> Couldn't figure it out. Well, she finally bought me t-shirts and I didn't have to worry about it. <laughs> and our other favorite place was the Lutheran churchyard. Now the parking lot. But we used to, it was like this. And we'd kick off and the guy up on top would start running and boy, he was pretty hard to bring down because he was going about 50 miles an hour. <laughs> but we, we, we had a great time. It was always fun. It was one of my fondest memories. When I was going up to, I lived over on Jefferson Street. The two favorite games was kick the stick and kick the can. I <laughs> Betty will remember some of those. We used to, the whole neighborhood would play those games. We just warm at the corner of one corner. We start playing these games. We just had a great time. Uh, when I was in grade school, I just played basketball, and our coach at that time was a fellow named Sherwood Deeds. Sherwood uh, was a great, great guy. Unfortunately, he lived across the commons from the gymnasium. So every Saturday, we'd go over and knock on his door and unlock the gym. Sometimes he'd play with us. Sometimes we always had the gymnasium to play in. And we, we appreciated that as young boys at that time. Uh, we, as Bill said, our spare time was not playing. We just did things on our own. We, we could call up people or just meet at various places and have a good time. Uh, I would like to comment on some of the businesses that were in Washington 65 years ago. Uh, on the corner where uh, Maloof is was a gas station. Finally, this was, we had, we had three dealerships just off the square. We had the Ford Garage just on Peoria Street, right now where Lindy's is. We had where the uh, KC's is, was Ed Essex Chrysler Plymouth dealership. And the parking lot by WRC was Martin's Pontiac, was the Pontiac dealership. So we had three, three dealerships right off, right off the square. Uh, we used to spend a lot of time Mm -hmm. 
I, the band concerts has been brought up a couple times. We used to have the best time at band, band concerts. Uh, and I was also involved in a few cannonball rolls. Most <laughs> 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 of the boys around town, I think, were involved in the point back there. There was a bowling alley, now with a sporting good store. Yes, I'm sure most of you remember that. Uh, Gamps Horns had a little shoe shop below what is now Gross's building. He was there for years and years and years. Uh, and Walt Holland's been mentioned. He had a barber shop and a pool hall, and it was a favorite hangout of most of us at one time or another. The Zilco, the theater, were all on the <coughs> north side of the square. Marshall's Tavern's been mentioned. Uh, the, the city building, which is now where the Standard Station is, was a very popular place. A lot of on there, including Bands of the Month, which my wife and I used to go to. We always enjoyed that until it moved out. Well, I guess the city building was torn down, so we had to leave. Myers had a Ludebaker yeah, drive to on, on South Main, so there were three four dealers yeah, uh, just within a block of the, of the city square. <laughs> on where the insurance office is, there was Mickey's Lunch, which uh, had a little bar where you, where you ate lunch, and in the back room they had a couple of monkeys. You could hear them chirping all the time. Uh, <laughs> Church offices, Springs Dress Shop, which later I think Linda's took over, wasn't it? Springs Dress Shop. Linda's Bakery? No, we're in between the two. Oh, yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. Post office used to be on South Main, then it moved over to the Knights of Columbus building now, where they're at. And then that's their building. Uh, I've, I've worked in Washington, I raised three children here. Two of them still live here. Uh, I was in business in, in Peoria, was hired right out of high school, out of college to be an insurance adjuster for a Cap Isle, who was one of the Isle Pony Farm members, and I did that for nine years, traveling uh, <coughs> primarily Kiwani, Galesburg, Kent, and Macomb areas. And I came in the office, moved in the office for five or six years, so I spent nine years there. And Mr. Essick offered me a job to come into his insurance agency, which I did in 1960. I stayed and sold insurance in Washington until 1991 when I figured I was 65. I just take life easy and I've been doing that ever since. I've enjoyed my life in Washington. I say my kids you know, all through all school here and all of them uh, went to college. Uh, I a little bit of a nurse, and she was in Las Vegas for that, and now <coughs> many years in Lafayette, in Indiana, and many years with Caterpillar there. Uh, I wouldn't have traded for anything. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you here tonight, and if you have any questions later on, we'll try to answer them. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Um, my name is Jim Lindsley, and um, how many people in this room are under 55 years of age? Exactly <laughs> what I thought. Three. I think somebody's trying to get to them. They asked to do this. Nancy Pope saw me in the back room. She goes, What? Some, she said, I can't come speak to those people. I, they're, they're, well, I'm more old than I am. I'm not that old yet. I can't, be, I, can't possibly be that old. I can't possibly be that old to show up and talk to those people. And the reply was, well, Jim Lindsay's going to be there. <laughs> well, for some of you, I, I know almost everybody in this room. So, and for some of you who don't know me, um, I, was, uh, I'm, I am 55 years old. I was born in Peoria. 
at the cost of $76.25. <laughs> but it was only a five day stay. <laughs> so I got to be born in a real hospital. <laughs> and uh, moved to Washington right after my birth. My dad built three houses in, uh, started by building three houses in Felker Subdivision. I don't know if you know where Felker Subdivision is, that's the subdivision right across from uh, Kimpling Ace Hardware. So the first two houses he built one, I think he sold it as a spec, the next house he moved into. Then he moved across the street, and uh, that's where I was, I was born and raised. And um, uh, it, it, out there, it was the, the outer limits of town. I mean, when I was eight years old, 1958, so to speak, there was nothing else there but cornfields. I mean, we didn't have any other businesses. You had to drive all the way down to Beverly Manor before you could run into another business. So uh, we were, I always felt like an outsider, you know, the other kid from the other side. I mean, I was not so far out there. I, I might as well go to Pleasant View School. I mean. <laughs> so anyway, I went to St. Pat's for eight years and graduated from there. I'm lucky. And then I went to Washington High School, graduated from there in 1968. One of the, it, the list she asked us to talk about pranks that happened. I thought one of the most famous pranks that I could think of. I didn't pull it off because I was just about a model citizen. <laughs> But it was a prank that happened while I was there. And if you remember, uh, these were good kids that pulled this off, too. They were outstanding, actually outstanding people. I mean, um, one of them was Sam Martin. He was smart, he was, he was sharp, but I don't know if anybody remember this or not, but uh, he, they pulled off a rather ingenious uh, maneuver. I thought it was really cool at the time, especially when I was going to school there. They stole yeah. So uh, class was dismissed with the sound of a bell, you know, every, every 50 minutes. Well, when first one came and they hit the, the switch was on timer and it was supposed to go off and nothing happened. So you can imagine what happened to this high school of about 1,100 kids when there was no order. And people are sitting there and they're watching the clock, the bell hasn't gone off. Anyway, after a, you know, after a half a day of investigation, they find that they have taken, they broke into the school building, taken a wrench, took all the bells off the mounts and put them on top of the roof. So, that was probably the biggest stunt, the biggest prank that ever happened. After high school, I was in the first class of ICC. I decided to go to ICC. I tried out. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I was always working for my dad up here at the store. Um, ended up graduating from there, or not graduating, finishing enough there to go on to Bradley. And then there I got a degree uh, in education. I thought, well, in case I don't like business, I can always be, uh, I'll do something else. I won't put all my eggs in one basket. So in 1972, I graduated from Bradley. And uh, I know it's not about my personal accomplishments, it's about history of Washington, but uh, I, I did teach, I ended up teaching school at Lincoln for a couple of years, which is something maybe people don't know. I uh, was hired by Bob Paxton uh, to be a part-time kindergarten through six PE teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so I would show up every morning in my shorts. And, uh, I worked along with a very wonderful lady there, who I think an awful lot of, and she's in this room today. And her name was Jean Keeley, and she had a whistle too. <laughs> and her and I worked there for a couple of years, and, and uh, we had the, I had some class. I worked there part time. Then I go home, and I would watch Green Acres at noon, and then I would change clothes, and I would go to work at the store. Uh, I'm married to a Washington woman named Beth. I have two children, Louie and Kara, and a wonderful uh, grandson named a grandson named Palmer. I'm very proud of a year old. That's pretty much it for for that. Going back to uh, some of the things about town, you know, I was born and raised here all my life. I did have a stint where I was, um, I lived in Eureka for 14 years, but I still worked in town when we had a second, a second site. But as a, as a kid growing up in Washington, we first bought the store, we were between the spring, the spring dress shop and Leonard's Bakery. And my dad bought the store from a man named Al Menz. And the reason I, I know that, you know, that we didn't buy it from Springs is because we had to go to Springs to go to the bathroom. <laughs> when my dad walked this store, first of all, I remember this very vividly. Um, if anybody knows my father, he's, he's 86 now, and um, he's, he's not like me. <laughs> and I'm not like him. I'll never be like my father. He's, he's an absolutely wonderful person. But one thing my dad cannot, you know, we'll always have our strengths. But my dad's not, my dad's not a real salesman. You know, and uh, my dad, I remember when I was about five or six years old, dad was trying to sell insurance. And so he, make, he 
and they gave him this speech, this insurance company, he would try and memorize it. And then he would go and try and talk to people by just mem with this memorized speech. And I remember sitting there in front of the chair watching him recite this thing to me and ask me if he got all the words right and everything else. And I, oh, at five years old, I just knew this, we were going to starve. <laughs> I just knew we were, I mean, I did. I was five years old. I knew we were in trouble. He was, he was, my dad was pathetic. Well, he decided he had, um, he had a few bucks in his pocket. And, and, and back in those days, he didn't, I guess you didn't have a whole lot to lose. I, I really don't know. But he, he, he sold groceries then after that. He sold some groceries for a company called Chris Heron Son that's over at Camp Street, East Peoria. And he went around and took orders and talked to people. Well, doing that, he ran into my mother who, and he went in the store to take an order. My mom was a checker, so my dad bought a berry. Is that corny? <laughs> so he always had this little flair for the grocery business. So he came back and he found out that Al Benz had this business for sale in the square. I was pretty old. I think it's Audrey's in the Audrey, are you here? Yes, I see, yeah. So dad bought this store. All right, I'm, I'm eight years old, and uh, we, we buy this thing. And, you know, it was one of those situations where it was, it was an older store. The furnace was out on the floor, so every time that the furnace kicked on, you know, we had, I mean, I'm not lying to you, we had, like, black smoke, <laughs> you know, black smoke come pouring out of this thing. Then we went in the back, and it didn't, have a, it didn't have a toilet. So every time we had to go to the bathroom, we had to go over and see Elmer and Mary Spring next door and ask if we could use their, use their restroom. Also, didn't have, it didn't have hot water. So you can imagine we had a, we had a grocery store that didn't have hot water. So um, we started off by getting the furnace, and it kind of worked this way. We got the furnace off the floor so that we could maybe work on our food sanitation. <laughs> we got the furnace off the floor, and it had wood floors back then, and I, uh, I remember this very vividly. It also had wood shelving, okay? As business got better at the store, we would load the shelving, and we had, had the store packed pretty good. One day we were standing there, and I was hanging out with my dad. He was had a salesman there, and I, you know, I was always had my nose and everything. And we were looking up the first aisle, and it was the wall that was against the, the bakery, but all 16 feet of that wooden shelving broke loose from the wall with all the glass canvas on it, and it fell over in the aisle. So we had to shut the store down that day because we it was only a two aisle grocery store, and you couldn't you couldn't get in. <laughs> Our shelf fell over and barricaded everybody out. I don't know if he remembers that or not. But, um, the, uh, the thing about it is we used to go to Leonard's and we you know, have to get our water and have to hold it back. <coughs> well, we got rid of the furnace. We, now we got a big time. It took us three years. We finally got a toilet, which was really big because we had to have our own toilet. You know, even though I'm 55, I know what it's like to rough it. <laughs> During that three, three year period, I mean, we had to have a sink because you had a toilet, so you had to do those things like in order. Because we didn't have any money. The first year that they worked, they made, this is just showing how bad, he just loved it. I saw, his, I saw their income. They made $1,700 in 19, 1958, and they both worked together, and they worked probably, I, if I didn't go to the store, I didn't see them. So that's just, that's just the way it was. If you're going to make it, you got to go to work, and that's... That's kind of how it was. So they had a seventeen hundred dollar income, and what money they had, they, they put back into the place, and they built the thing back up, and they plow a little bit more in, plow a little bit more up. Well, then finally one day we got carpeting because we used to have a wood floor. We got carpeting, and then we start getting hot water instead of hauling it over in pails from, from Leonard's. If anybody remembers Leonard's Bakery, it was kind of it's kind of a famous place. Uh, Johnny always made what he called graveyards. I don't know if anybody had a graveyard or not. I loved them, and what it was was. You would get a glass and you'd say, Johnny, and Johnny was, where was he from? I don't know what nationality, Lithuania or, could be, I don't know. He was a tight lock. <laughs> he had his last, when he died, I'll tell you, so when he died, he, he was a tight lock. But anyway, he would take, he'd go down his fountain and he would get one thing of everything in the glass. So you got the entire counter in your glass and that, and he put some phosphate on it and drink, it was called a graveyard. You know. <laughs> Every time he tasted it, tasted it. He had great glazed donuts. He had a lot of cockroaches. <laughs> he had a lot of cockroaches. I'm telling you, you didn't have sanitation back then. He had a lot of cockroaches. Huh? Raisin bread. <laughs> Started, that was a delivery service. 
Now that was real smart. We didn't have any money, so my dad decides the way to make money is to give people credit. Because we had charge accounts and free delivery, and we couldn't make it. <laughs> so I remember dad, he'd get short, he might go to some, get in the book and look and see who maybe hadn't paid for a while and ask if they could help him out. And that's kind of how that thing worked. You'd get on the phone, you go, you know, I'm having a little, I need a little help this month. Can you maybe put something on your account? It'd be like, I'm going, oh, we're never going to be, you know, we're never going to eat. You know, we're never <laughs> No way to run a business, you know. It's just, it's just, we have hot water, we have got a toilet, we can keep the credit. So, you know, I, I'm the kid who lived there and I had this delivery service. I thought I was really cool because I got to ride around with people in her, her age, you know, Gary Kaufman and all those guys. And they were, the, my dad would hire them for Ben Underwood. He, he hired those guys, um, Doc Potter's son, Jack. Jack Potter, you know, all these guys in high school, you know, I'm, I'm, eight, nine years old. So I got to ride shotgun in the delivery car. You know, I kept the window down, stick my arm out, <laughs> drive around town with a high school kid, my dad paid him to do it. You know, I thought that was that part was pretty neat. But um, growing up in town was was a, it was a wonderful thing because of all the things that happened. But in 19, 1969 we had a little setback in our family we had a we had a fire. If you remember the fire in the square, um, Johnny set the bakery on fire. He fell asleep. He used to sleep back there all the time on the needy. He used to fall asleep on the he worked so long he because he made things from scratch, you know. Fell asleep on the needing board and started a fire. Well, that fire, that, that that block over there is so old that what caused the damage wasn't so much the flames, so much as the soot. So the smell went through all and the, and the block over there, you know, is very porous. So it went through all that up and down that whole block. So everybody had everybody had the, the effects of Leonard's bakery. And I'll never forget. We were up there, and uh, he had money. He had his. He had a lot of money stashed in the flush boxes of, the, of his toilet and other, you know, funny places of his bakery. And while this bakery's on fire, Johnny, I don't know how old he was then, a bit chunky, chunky. He's running inside and in, in, in and out of this bakery, trying to get all his money out of it. I mean, but this guy's got stuff coming out of his nose. The guy was killing himself doing it. But, you know, he had that place pretty well stocked with his, uh, his, his funds. <laughs> well, the, the health department came, and at that time, Brad Essig worked for me, and uh, Dr. Essig did, and a couple other of my friends, about four of my friends from high school worked there. And we had a, the health department came in and said, you got to get rid of everything. All the canned goods, everything. So we had to get dumpsters and, and, and take shovels and just get rid of everything. I mean, perfectly good stuff. Well, we came across um, these uh, hair colors, hair color, women's hair coloring. So all four of us guys decided to blonde. <laughs> we thought we can go blonde for nothing. So rather than, rather than throw it out, we all dyed our hair. <laughs> Whatever. Um, but you know. It, it's been it's it's been a, 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 a wonderful experience to be in business in Washington, to be involved in people's lives, to stand in the aisles and have people come in and, and there's there's you know this tragedy that goes with it because there's there's people that unfortunately because you make so many friends, people pass and you see things happen to people and you watch people <coughs> lose their loved one or you watch them lose a son or a daughter and it's tough, um, but you share that and. Um, that's life, and that's living life, and it's not, you know, it's it's what's neat about this town is, is that people share, and um, we had a reporter come into the store one time um, that not too long back worked for Tazewell County Reporter, and she was from Romania or something. I would remember what was, what was her name. Remember her name? I didn't make notes. Maria Marina. Yeah, Maria Hingis or somebody, some tennis player. I don't know. She came in. And she walked in. And she was talking about shop, and I said. Got to talk to her, and, and, and by talking to her, she, she said, "I don't care for this." She said, "I'm from. I like big towns because in small towns, people know your business." And I said, "You're missing out." I said, "You need to quit your job right now and go someplace else because you're not going to appreciate what you've really got here. Um, to, to, to live in a town like this, where somebody's got a problem, somebody needs to know something, somebody calls up and says, "Can you help me? You know this. Can you give me the answer?" or some people just get help without even asking. That happens all the time, too. Um, but it has been a lot.
me, I mean, I, you know, I don't have a, you know, uh, I can't take you way back like some of these guys can. But it's also an honor to know these people. You know, it's an honor to know these people that have molded and shaped this town. You know, I haven't done anything yet. I'm way too young. <laughs>
And I do want to thank Jim for mentioning the community center. I don't know how many of you know, but that is one of my very, very, very pet projects, and I spend a lot of time up there working, and um, I am so anxious to see it come and be here. And I had, uh, several years ago, I made some of my friends promise me that if I was too old, by the time it was built, that they would at least take me up in a wheelchair and wheel me around the track. <laughs> now I think I'm going to make it. I think I'm going to be able to walk around the track on my own. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, Don and I came to Washington in 1956, exactly 50 years ago. Uh, uh, Don had been, just been discharged from the uh, Air Force. And uh, he was enrolled in graduate school at uh, Greeley, Colorado. But a friend told us about a job opening in Washington, and so Don applied for the job of uh, coach and teacher at the uh, grade school on Walnut Street. And uh, he did get the job, and so we um, had to move to Washington. In those days, the, if you were a teacher, you lived in the community where you taught. And we were perfectly happy in Peoria, and Don was commuting out, and, and I was working in Peoria, but um, every member of that school board was helping us look for a place to live. We get calls to come and look at, we looked at chicken coops and quonset huts. <laughs> in 1956, there just was nothing to rent in Washington. And so we would come and look at them and turn well, because of pressure from the school board, we settled on an apartment in the Washington State Bank building uh, off of Ray Heipel's office, which is now, Ray Heipel's office is now the beautiful dining room at the bed and breakfast, and uh, our apartment is now the Garden of Eden. <laughs> apartment did not look like the garden <laughs> but it was it was desperation time now, in fact our bathroom had a had a I never seen one before had a, a the uh, commode was hanging you know the tank was on the ceiling and you pulled the chain to, to flush the toilet and had a claw, claw uh, foot tub and what have you but um, uh, we lived up there for nine months uh, about nine months I was so glad that not a lot of people in Washington knew me because I had to take my rugs and my dust claws and my dust mop down on Main Street to shake them there. <laughs> I went down past Ray Heifel's office with all my stuff and, and shook it out on Main Street and, and went back upstairs to clean my apartment. <laughs> and so um, uh, we, we survived. I had, um, uh, I had um, uh, bought all new furniture. Don was coming home from service and I knew that and I worked for a couple of lawyers in Peoria and one of them was a good friend of Mr. Littman and uh, so he said, you know, I can get you a good deal on furniture. So I had bought new beautiful furniture at Littman's and they came and hauled it up those steps up, to the, up into that apartment and, um, and it all worked out fine. Um, I got tired of the uh, commute to Peoria, and I went to work at the Savings and Loan, the Washington Savings and Loan. I worked with Eunice Summer, and I don't know how many of you knew Eunice. She was a doll, and and Ed Hobbecker Sr. <coughs> he was just the, the nicest person that you could ever hope to meet, and I have fond memories of it. And of course, at the Savings and Loan, by hand in ledgers. And of course, it had to be perfect. If any of you knew Eunice, it, it, you, you worked to perfection. And uh, Mr. Hobbecker would go out every morning, and we could always tell when he had had a really stimulating conversation someplace, because he would come in with fire in his eyes, and he would say, we do not need changes in this town. We need to keep the town just the way it is. We do not need to grow. So-and-so was talking about bringing a, a new um, business in here, and we do not need new businesses. We need to keep our small town atmosphere and um, just stay the way we are. And he was really an interesting character. So uh, he, um, uh, he was fun to work for, and um, uh, we always knew when he had had a, a stimulating conversation. And I often think, oh, my. He just really would be spinning in his grave when he, he saw Washington now and knew what has gone on and seen what is happening here. 
and you're gone to carry the rest of the story. <laughs> I can't think of one advantage of being the last. <laughs> <laughs> Betty Pride, I did come here in 1956 and uh, got the job as a geography teacher uh, in seventh grade, and I was also uh, uh, given coaching responsibilities to coach uh, baseball in the fall, basketball in the winter, and uh, track in the spring. Uh, my salary, my base salary was uh, $3,080, $3,480. They gave me $600 for coaching, so I made just a little over $4,000. And believe it or not, I thought that was a lot of money. Because I just got out of service and I was living on a serviceman's pay, and when I saw that, that looked pretty good. So uh, I was uh, not the least bit uh, disappointed. Uh, my first day at, at school was uh, kind of a surprise for me. Uh, Several surprises, in fact. Uh, the morning of the first day uh, was for teachers' meetings. And, uh, of course, uh, one of the things on the agenda was to introduce new teachers. I was one. And another one was a lady uh, who was introduced, and she looked real familiar. Uh, but I didn't really recognize the name. And so, uh, after uh, uh, we were dismissed, I walked over to her. And introduced myself and, and uh, said, uh, do I know you from somewhere? And uh, she said, yes. Uh, she says, I was your history teacher in high school. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. <laughs> uh, as you might suspect, uh, the grade school staff at that time was primarily uh, female. Uh, a lot of uh, teachers had been there for a long, long time. Uh, I was more familiar with the, the teachers at Washington School. Uh, Marcella Travis, uh, Carrie Foster, uh, Verna Herbst, uh, Beulah Schertz, Mary Garber, uh, Genevieve Langston, Helen Thomas, uh, Mr. Staley, Winnie White. Uh, a fella that I became very close friends to because he was a White Sox fan. The only one I ever found in Washington. <laughs> that was Gus Gustafson. He and I shared a lot of stories together. And Nancy, the music teacher, was Joyce Walker. Yes, I knew that. <laughs> and by the way, Nancy was in seventh grade. Was it seventh grade? Yes, I remember well. <laughs> uh, just out of curiosity, uh, the enrollment at Washington School, when I started there, was 792 on the first day. And I called uh, the district office the other day to find out what the present enrollment is. And it was 812. <laughs> but that included kindergarten. When I started, Washington didn't have a kindergarten. Lorraine Durth had a kindergarten. Uh, Mrs. Putnam had a kindergarten. And I think there were several other kindergartens besides those. So if you want to add it in the kindergarten, our enrollment back in 1956 would have been larger than it is today. And I suppose there are, are several inferences that you can draw from there. I, uh, I suspect one of them is that families are smaller today. Um, and the, the district, with the exception of the president who was added, is, is pretty well constricted. And as most of you know today, the growth is in the central grade school area. But I thought that was, that was kind of unusual. And of course, being coach, uh, the first team that you coach is always a memorable one. And in fact, I brought some pictures along uh, of some of the teams, and one of them was the first one that I, I coached. And on that team was Kenny Black, and his brother Bruce. Uh, Terry Boudet was on that team. Uh, Roger Lawless, Roger Huner. Uh, on, that was a heavyweight team. Uh, at that time in grade school, we didn't have seven to eight teams. You had lightweight and heavyweight. And <coughs> the weight determined where you fell into, into the category. And on a lightweight team, there was uh, Mike Martin, uh, Tom Connor, uh, Butch Hafer, uh, let's see who else. Uh, and about a year or two later, there was another fellow on that team. Uh, he's in the audience. 
might be able to locate the picture of them there. I think it's gross. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was fortunate to have the coach him. Uh, I don't recall too much about the season. Uh, we did win more than, than we lost. Uh, and uh, that, in fact, in my eyes, was, uh, was an accomplishment. Uh, I coached for several more years. Uh, the last year I coached, uh, we were fortunate. We uh, had some outstanding uh, players, and uh, we went to the state that year. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our best player broke his glasses about the first minute of the game, and uh, we couldn't get it repaired. And I, I don't even know if he scored. And he was always our leading scorer, and the end result was we got beat. And I often wonder what would have happened if he won his class. <laughs> but, uh, that, that's something that uh, uh, we'll never know. Uh, and one other thing I remember my first year of uh, being a rookie. Um, I think it was the first or second game, and uh, we were getting ready for the game to start. And uh, uh, Bob Summer and uh, Bernd Stuber walked in, and they were officiating the game. And I saw him at the end and directed him down to the dressing room. And about five minutes later, two more officials showed up. And I think Noah Hickman was one of the other ones. And I remember, Dick, were you one of them? I don't know. Anyway, we had two sets of officials. And fortunately, they all lived in town, and I kind of made a joke of it. And uh, I don't even remember who fucking ended up officiating the game, but there I was. I was mortified. <laughs> How dumb can you get? But anyway, it, it, it worked out of the way. Uh, there were a lot of things uh, to do in Washington at that time. Uh, uh, television was still uh, well, pretty minimal. Uh, reception really wasn't that great yet. You never had a cabin here. You had to turn them all in different directions to get reception. And so it really wasn't that great, but uh, uh, they had the band concert. But by that time, I, by the time we got to Washington, the band concerts were down at the grade school grounds. They had moved them uh, out of uh, the square. So we went to band concerts, and of course, the, the Tazel Theater was there. So we had, at, uh, when we lived downtown, it was right around the corner from us. So we could do that. Uh, and uh, uh, the first couple of years, um, uh, I played softball out at Sullivan's Field on the east side of town. They had a church league, and it was a real active league, very competitive. I think most of the churches had a team in it. That was uh, uh, where I met uh, Glenn Harkins, and Glenn Harkins was a uh, fiery competitor. And uh, uh, the team I played with uh, the first year or two, uh, uh, we were competitive of his. And then uh, a couple years later, uh, uh, we were on the stage. And uh, I always enjoyed playing against uh, Glenn. Uh, he, he played to win, and uh, he was a real good sportsman. Uh, other things went on. Of course, the high school basketball was, was big at that time. Dick Van Syke was coaching here. Of course, uh, that was before the new gym was built. And uh, they played in what's now the girls' gym. And they played a lot of good teams. I remember Galesburg used to come over here and play. The teams, East Moline used to come over here and play. Saw some real great games there. And of course, Nancy uh, alluded to the fact that they went to state, and, uh, and several times they were in the sectional. So it's a real good, uh, good basketball. And, and uh, football was good. Of course, the football field at that time was just well where uh, the Tory Gym is now, and to the east of, of uh, the high school. And they played the football games there, and Noel Hickman was the coach, and they had some real good football teams. Mel Romini was uh, uh, playing quarterback. And they just had some outstanding teams. Um, and I remember, oh, one thing I remember the first year we were here, uh, the Fall Festival was always down downtown on the square. And they had some great entertainment. Uh, you know, I don't know who made the context, but they had the entertainment from WLS. And I don't know how I remember Patsy Montana. <laughs> okay, well that goes back to it. And Red Blanchard. Uh, and, uh, they were they played on the square the first year we were there. And uh, then the next year, uh, a real big uh, show from uh, WLS 
Captain Stubby and the Buccaneers. <laughs> and so I often wondered how many guys were so fortunate to get those, those big stars. But they did, and they drew big crowds. Big crowds. Um, <laughs> Washington, when we came here, was, was probably just on the verge of, of breaking out as far as growth is concerned. Uh, Rufus Rich was uh, in the planning stages for Oakwood Circle at that time. There was not a house out there, but they were in the planning stages. And Hillcrest Drive was also in the planning stages. And along with that was the golf course. Uh, Leroy Schlegel and uh, Mr. Brubaker were uh, planning the golf course. It was, it was on the drawing boards. And Crestview Motel. <laughs> if you can remember that. Uh, and uh, to the other side of town, uh, the Avatar already had a couple of streets. It wasn't real big yet, but uh, it, it had a couple of streets. So there, there were a lot of things going on. And uh, Bill uh, mentioned Central School. Uh, the first year that we were here was the year that Central School decided to buy property in Washington Estates. They were still holding school we had at the uh, building where the church is now. But they voted to uh, uh, plan for expansion and they bought the land. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was interesting. And uh, St. Mark's also had their addition uh, to their church. Was, was it? So there were, there were just a, uh, a lot of things going on. Uh, the Kroger store. Uh, was under construction. It wasn't finished yet when we got here, but it was under construction. And uh, it uh, opened the next spring, and uh, I wasn't sure on the date, so uh, I checked the date out, and when I did it, I ran across an ad. And uh, they were advertising the, 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 their specials, and one of the specials was a banner break for 10 cents. <laughs> so she talked about low no prices and 10 cent bread. Uh, I remember that, but I'm sure we must have taken advantage of it. Um, Washington was a lot of issues, though, back at that time. Um, one of the issues was the uh, fall festival on the square. A lot of merchants were, well, I should say a lot, but some merchants were not pleased with it. They said it really hurt their business. And they went to the city council. And they had a number of meetings on it. And after a year or two, it finally came to a vote. And, and they voted to continue. Now, I, I can't recall how much longer it continued after that, but I don't think it was for a uh, very long uh, period of time. Another issue that was being discussed uh, uh, the first year was uh, Park District. There was a movement afoot for Park District back in 1956. And Wilson Kimmel was the big driver back to that. And uh, they had numerous meetings, invited people out from Peoria. And it finally came to a vote in 1957. And it was voted down by a two to one vote. It was not even close. And of course, uh, 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 there were several reasons given for it, but the most common one was that the economy was not good at that time and uh, farmland would suffer the most from the taxation that would go along with it. So it failed at that time. Uh, but uh, as you well know, it came back and it passed. And you know, today we have one of the uh, finest park districts around for a city this size. Uh, after uh, eight years of coaching, uh, I got into uh, the administrative side of, of uh, education. Uh, I missed the coaching, <coughs> but uh, uh, the economic side of it offset, I guess. <laughs> uh, and uh, we talked about pranks. Well, at that age, I, I wasn't pulling any pranks, but uh, being a, a grade school principal, I had some pranks pulled on me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of them that I remember very vividly was uh, uh, one day I came home and went to the mail, and I ran across. Uh, an issue of Playboy. <laughs> uh, turned out that uh, some of my good students had uh, gotten together and pooled their money and bought me years to spend. <laughs> Uh, 
three, uh, I uh, decided to uh, change courses uh, and I uh, left the school business and uh, got into banking and uh, we moved to Chillicothe and I was employed at the bank in Chillicothe for 10 years. And uh, in 1983, I got a phone call from Jim McDaniel. He said, Don, he says, I'm thinking about retiring. He said, uh, would you consider coming back to Washington? And I said, well, I said, uh, I have to give that some thought. And so I went home and uh, told Betty about the phone call. And uh, we both decided that uh, that would be a good uh, Not only from the uh, standpoint that we'd be going to uh, a little bit larger bank, but we still had a lot of friends here. And in fact, we belonged to a car club. But, uh, we got together a month. So it was really like returning back home. And, you know, as, as we said at the beginning, uh, we were not native to Washington, but we've lived in Washington longer than we had any place else in our lives. And so we considered our home. Uh, our kids were born here. Uh, my oldest daughter uh, graduated from uh, junior high here. And uh, our youngest daughter uh, attended grade school for a number of years. So. It's really a home for us. Uh, when we came back to Washington, uh, things had changed, uh, particularly to the west. The building out west was unbelievable. Cherry Tree Shopping Center had been built. Uh, so that whole area had changed. But uh, the town itself uh, was still a nice, friendly, hometown atmosphere. We had a small town and community field, but yet we weren't too far from shore if we really needed to go someplace to buy something that wasn't available here. I've always said that I've been very fortunate in that I've had a chance to deal with people's two most prized possessions, the kids and their money. <laughs> <laughs> and it, uh, it really kind of hit me here when uh, came back here and started working at the bank and some of my customers were kids I had in school. <laughs> so I figured it was really all worth it. <clears throat> we've enjoyed our stay here and we've worked many more years here. Appreciate the invitation to be here. And uh, I've enjoyed the remarks that these people have been me and given. Thank you. very educational and inspiring and entertaining stories and I think this year we've enjoyed it as much and more than we ever have before. Um, I, I just want to thank all of you so much. I, I think you came up with great stories to tell and uh, we really appreciate it. Do any of you have any questions you want to ask before the panel uh, shares cookies and coffee with us? Any memories you want to bring up to ask if they recall? <coughs> Yes. Question, uh, uh, people talk about skating at Red Tip. Is that like where Birchwood Circle is located now and, and the east of there? It's on the, on, it's on the south side of the railroad track, the low spot here, basically. Uh, behind the city building? Evil Road. No, no. Oh, oh, Evil Road. On the which side? North side of the square. North side of the square. <coughs> Anybody remember that? What? Stiff Kyle's newsstand. Frank, Frank Kyle was his real name, and he lived in the big house right next door to the Christian church, the old Christian church. Well, I guess not too many people do. <laughs> well, that, that that was the first newsstand that was I remember back, and then I mean I don't want to cut in on some of this information, but. 
Elmer Spring had a newsstand that he took over from Frank Kyle before Johnny Leonard had that bakery. Frank Kyle had a It was called the Humpty Dumpty. Frank Kyle was on the right. Humpty Dumpty. Was it in the, was it in the, the bakery Frank then? Kyle was no. It was, uh, that was before the bakery and then Johnny moved from up there where you went up into the uh, uh, where they Masons, books. where the Masons had their business upstairs in okay. their room. He had the little root long side there. Where the paper moons it was. The, I, don't know what, I don't know what's there now. Not upstairs, because, but it was down but, downstairs. Uh, he moved from there to, uh, he bought the, uh, oh, it was the newsstand. <laughs> well, it was next to the next to Herbst. Ben Franklin. Yep, between them two. And then Johnny took over and it run the ice cream shop and the bakery together. But I delivered papers out of that newsstand with Elmer Spring. We like Elmer's plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness Elmer had a restaurant. So I went around before. Well, there was a mention earlier about going into Peoria by a train. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you talk about the transportation to Peoria from that point to today? I mean, in terms of building the bridges and how you would get there, and how long it would take, and etc. Uh, one of the ways, depending on what part of Peoria you wanted to go into, the Franklin Street Bridge was there, and the old Upper Free Bridge, which was above the McCluggage Bridge, where you see the uh, Power line poles coming out, kind of jutting the river over the narrows. That was the old Upper Free Bridge. It was a steel frame, but it had wood decking. It was about three inches thick, laid crossways. And you had to be very careful. Those plank had spikes in it were at least six inches long. And when it would warp, they would twist a little. When you'd over it with a car, you're acting as a lever. So you're bringing these nails up all the time. It was very easy to get a flat tire going across that bridge. I'm tell you. The Franklin Street Bridge, as you know, was caked because when they completed the first bridge, the east section went down before it was ever by the public. And rather than tear all of that equipment out and lift it out, they wanted to get it up and going and put the cake in it, parallel to it, and came out by where Steak and Shake used to be. Incidentally, when Steak and Shake opened there, I think that was about the fourth one, third or fourth one they had, and the steak and shake combined, and this is a tall glass with 19 cents. <laughs> and this is a mixed up thing, you know, ice cream, the full deal, not putting in frozen custard. <laughs> I thought of one other thing while we were sitting here. We used to go coasting on West Hill, probably most of you know where that is, you know where the so-called telephone office where it was, just on top of the hill. Behind that, the hill was fairly steep, and you could come down two hills, and we sometimes arranged to try to have crashes in the <laughs> when, my, when my father, back to his age, he lived on top of that hill on the south side a little bit, and at that time, they went down the street, which was a one-lane road, like I said, going toward Peoria. I have a sled bus out at Elms now, it's a flexible flyer. The wood on it is walnut, and the, what, the runners are about um, oh, two inches higher than what you see a, a sled now. It was a little bigger in all respects. And that belonged to somebody in Peoria that used to come out here coasting on a train. And they left it at Dad's house, which is on top of the hill, and never claimed it. So I used that all when I was a boy. That was a great one to use when the sleds Crashed because the bigger than anybody else's sleep. <laughs> <laughs> is that where the telephone company was? It is now? Uh, yes, just behind that. That was a pasture. Well, that was my grandpa Berkey's. Okay. They yeah. lived there. Could be. They lived there. It was a Hardy family had a house that lived on that hill. It was a small home with a large family. Yeah, my grandparents. <laughs> There's so a couple of things that I, I forgot to mention. Uh, when we were living downtown, uh, right around the corner from us was the A&P store. And we used to go in there and do a lot of our shopping there for groceries. And uh, uh, two of the people I, I remember very vividly, one was Marie Marsh. Used to be a checker. 
And every once in a while, uh, someone would come in and, and bag for him, and that was made at Blumenstein. <laughs> and the other thing uh, that I remember was Land's uh, men's store. When, when we came here, and I bought something at Land's, and when you bought something there, they put your name in a drawing for a suit. And uh, so I bought something and put my name in. Well, at the end of the month, they would draw your name out, and then that went into the grand drawing, which is usually held toward the, toward the end of the year. Well, come December, they, they had the grand drawing, and lo and behold, I won a suit. I've never won anything before in our since, but I won a suit. Silpo was there, too. How did you get from Washington to the Upper Free Bridge? Mainly the Rosenbach Road, if you know okay. what I'm talking about. Okay. That comes right yeah. up the hill down to the Upper Free Bridge now. You want to have good breaks when you go down there. <laughs> <laughs> very, very I remember going to Fury when we were young, you always had to give it an extra 20 minutes in case yes. the bridge was up. It's yeah. a very yeah. scary bridge, too, because those banks made a lot of noise. You figured you're going to be in the water. Mm -hmm. When you was a kid, it was scary. Well, also, the Cedar Street Bridge was built, started in the 30s, and then refreshed, and they called it the longest bridge in the world because it was half done for years and years and years. I also remember going to Perry one day when we were kids and parking on the river. That's, you know, everybody, there was hundreds of cars parked on the river. It was Christmas season. My dad had a 37 Packer. This was not a <coughs> car. He drove right out on the river. Oh, my God. cars, and, and they were all there when we got back, everybody floated away. <laughs> you know, the river didn't used to be so deep. The dam was put in in the early 30s for river navigation to maintain a channel of eight or nine feet. Before that, there were very shallow spots for any portions of the year. Which is why I'm present. And um, many times people would, uh, when it got cold, and freeze and just drive across the river and pick up the street. They didn't bother. <laughs> When Nancy, is there any truth to the rumor that you were the only person in Washington High School uh, history that was a class president three years and a senior class president three years in a row? <laughs>